Have you ever met someone in your life where you know you just want to be friends with the first time you meet with them? Well, this is what's gonna happen to you today when you meet our guest, Juan Roberto Lopez. A guy who just enjoys life and everything that life can bring to him. My name is Stefan Reinhardt, Director of Education for the Clear Institute. Welcome to The Odd Couple. One of the things that, uh, that you and I discussed about The Odd Couple, uh, Pod Couple Oddcast, um, is that we wanted to uh, have a very broad uh, scope of things including different cultures because you're French Canadian and I'm US and uh, this next interview that we're going to do with Juan Roberto Lopez takes the odd couple basically into three uh, different facets one being French Canadian one being US and Juan Roberto Lopez is Colombian mm-hmm. now uh, what about the the podcast with Juan Roberto did you find most fascinating? His t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Now, there, there was an instant connection there, wasn't there? There was. There was, of course, yes. And it was on purpose on his side, so that was even better. Yeah, well, the, you know, there are, there are those that believe that music is the only entity It's the only vapor that can Mm -hmm. transcend the space between earth and heaven. Mm. Now, of course, people hear that and they think of religious music and they, but what is that? What is religious music? Maybe music is your religion, Jerry? Well, music, um, I mean, it's it's an an interesting emotional experience, but the emotional experience with Juan Roberto Lopez and another thing that we, we really dove all the way into the deep end of the pool with was um, uh, the power that women have in different cultures. And um, I think that people watching uh, this issue of the odd couple uh, will be quite interested in what Juan Roberto has to say about his uh, wife, her career, and uh, the changes in his own career. Yeah. So, how do you say it without further ado? Right. Uh, we're and what, now that we know that you're wild with anticipation, <laughs> Juan Roberto Lopez and the odd couple. We're here with Juan Roberto Lopez. Uh, a very good and close friend of mine, and we refer to each other as brother, actually, frequently and uh, not without reason. Uh, Juan Roberto, you're right now sitting in Medellin, Colombia, right? Yes, now it's, uh, we're in the middle of the rainy season here in Colombia. We don't have seasons, as you know, in the States, like summer, spring, summer and fall, no. We only have... Wait, wait, wait. wait. Is is it going to be like that for the whole podcast or just want to know? It it depends on you, on the musical references that you both uh, give to me. So maybe I'll show my singing side. It's not very good, but I'll give it a try. We're in the middle of of the raining season and for us it's cold. But here I am. We don't have snow, so... Your, um, tell us, tell us just a bit about your educational background. When did? Wait, because before I have to ask that question, I asked that question last time with Larry Gerald. I want to know how you guys met. How did Juan Roberto and I meet? Juan Ro, you tell. Okay, Jerry came here in, I think it was the end of the 90s, beginning of the new century. He came here to give a course. I'm a simultaneous translator, and I was the guy in charge of translating Jerry Sampson. 
So we met there, there and it was instant click. We okay. became close friends and here we are calling us hermanos. 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 Uh, a bit about when did you finish dental school and where was that? Okay, I went to dental school in, in Bogota. It, I finished in 1988 and I started in, 90, in 91 my pedo training also here in Medellin and after finishing my pedo I started my ortho training and I finished in 1997. I was in practice until last year. I'm finishing my last cases now. I go to this office. I rent one Wednesday a month every afternoon and I'm finishing my last three, four patients now. Why did you decide to stop private practice? There's many reasons, but the two main reasons were, first of all, I started to become tired of the daily practice and most of the daily practice was not the kids it was the moms and here the the practice i had was a, a high-end class but the moms didn't go into the consult only they went the first consult from there on they sent in the drivers or the mates so i had to communicate with them and Many times I had to call the mom. The mom was too busy. No, send me any message through the driver. And yeah, but one, you could have done the same and send your driver and your maid. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a. Dr Luckily, I don't have a driver or I don't have a maid. So, and the other reason is that a person you're gonna hear a lot during this podcast is Sarita, which is my significant other, said, why wait until you're 62, your retirement age, to enjoy life? Who guarantees that at age 62, you're going to be in excellent physical shape? So let's plan and let's make things happen now. So those two things combined made me decide I wanted to close my practice. So how are you enjoying life? How do I enjoy life now? Pre-pandemic, I used to, yeah. yeah. Pre-pandemic, Sarita was living in Spain. She was doing a master's degree in literature and in creative writing. So every three, four months, I travel to Europe and we travel all around Europe or travel inside Spain and Madrid is a fascinating city and I have a cabin here in Colombia which Jerry has been there and I hope you will come when you come to Medellin it's a must visit in place you have to go there it's called Rio Cedro it's in the middle of nowhere we don't have even internet no cell phones no signal and I go there every two three months I'm leaving there this sun this Saturday and that's what I did. Sarita, the beach, uh, the cabin on the beach, and reading. I ride my bicycle and music. That's my. That was my life. Now, pandemic times, PT. I read. I watch TV. I listen to a lot of music. I try to keep my music spectrum as fresh as possible keep the classics, but try to, to listen to new music. And there's a thing I really enjoy and it's sleeping. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you play any music in any, any instruments? No, not at all. No? And never, ne it was never something you wanted to learn or to incorporate in your, no? When I was like 10 or 12, my parents got me into guitar class. Yeah. But the music the teacher taught me was old music and I didn't want to play old music. No, I wanted to play rock and roll and he didn't know anything about rock and roll. So it was disappointed and I quit like a year into the classes. 
I did the same thing. I did the same thing. I started classical guitar, and I was after a year and a half. This is not what I want to play. But at the time, there was no YouTube. There was no, nothing to you know to be able to learn. I, I look today how easy it is. Yeah. With everything, all the tutorials you can have online, or and and it's it's completely different. But well, so one, um, you have quite a an interesting. Um, first of all, you're you're Colombian. Yeah. And, uh, so we have a Colombian, a French Canadian, and whatever I am pretending to be at the moment, which could change. So as far as the culture of Colombia, um, how would you describe Colombian culture since obviously your English is spectacular. You spent a fair amount of time in the US. Uh, I mean, your father, was your father the first US trained orthodox in Colombia or is that not right? No, he wasn't the first one, but I wanna tell the story of my father, how, how my father ended up in Chicago. My father ended his ended dental school in 62, 63. My father's name was Walter. So he wanted to go to uh, an orthodontic uh, school in the States. So he applied to Loyola. But my father didn't know how to write or speak English. But he had a patient who was from the States. So the patient filled in the application form uh, remember, this is pre-everything, 1968-1968. So, the patient who was an American wrote the essay perfectly. My father, my father dis didn't know even how to say yes or no. So, my father receives an acceptance from Loyola, and he says, "Okay, so what I'm gonna do? I don't know how to speak English." So he has two kids. He goes four months in advance to Chicago to learn the language. He lives in a YMCA. <laughs> he, he learns more or less like to say yes, no, to ask for scrambled eggs for breakfast, nothing more. And he presents himself to the chairman of the program one day before the program starts. So there's no chance they're gonna turn him down. And he, he mastered the, his program and we lived in Chicago for two years. Huh? So that's how I lived in, the, in, in Chicago. I don't have a lot of memories about it, but I'm sure that my, I was only four. Okay. But it influenced a lot of how I live and who I am. And when we returned to Colombia, I came to study in, in an American school. So I never forgot my, my English. Okay. Um, how would you compare Colombian culture uh, as a male, as a man, compared to US culture? Okay, first of all, here, the man is who traditionally sets the rules. It's a very macho, a very Latino culture. But now with feminism, things have started to change. But here I remember my father was the provider. My mom never worked. She didn't even have to consider or my father even suggested to my mom to, to work. It was my father's responsibility to provide for his family. Now things have changed and we used to be a, ve a very unequal society. Still we are a very unequal society. Rich people in Colombia were very rich. Still the rich people are very rich, but we didn't have a middle class. Mm -hmm. In the last 20 years, there has been a rise in the middle class. And I think that one of the reasons that middle class has risen is because women have started to work. I think it's quite remarkably interesting that you've now explained uh, your family background and this huge influence of the Colombian culture in, in this um, macho machismo. Yeah. However, in your relationship with Sara, there is a remarkable switch. Um, 
Would you explain just a little bit about Sada's uh, background and maybe a bit, if you would, how you met her? Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Um, I had some dark years, very dark years in my life. And finally, I got away from those uh, dark years and I, one of the things I did to, to, when I got divorced, I didn't want to become this man who starts to date all the chicks. Ah, no, I didn't want that. Not that, really, there, not that there's, not that there's anything wrong with that. No, 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 no. And I'm not judging, but I wanted to be in peace with myself. So I, I secluded myself for nine months. That was what I did. And finally, one day I said, okay, I hit rock bottom. Now it's time to climb out of this hole. And during it, it, that, I want to make one uh, clarification. I think all of us, uh, maybe that's too broad of a statement, but I think at a certain point, everybody has something very dark uh, that happens to them. And uh, those dark things in, in your case, since uh, I think as everyone knows, you and I are very close friends. This had nothing to do with drugs or alcohol. No, that was not the dark. No, the darkness was your relationship with your former wife. Yeah. Okay. So just I thought, that, I thought that he was, he just started to listen to French Canadian music. <laughs> 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 no, it was my ex-wife. Okay. So you decided at a certain point, you decided that's it. I'm, I'm going to uh, fix this. Yes. No, it was even the, the other way around. I was so like, this was such a harmful relationship. She had even, she made the decision to, to finish things. I was convinced that if it wasn't her, there was nothing left for me in life. So if I, I haven't seen her since it's been 15 years now, but if I see her, the first thing I go, I'm going to tell her is thank you. Gracias. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. finally, yeah. So finally, I made this decision to crawl out of this hole. And one day I was snapping, watching television, and this blonde is on the screen. And her full name was below, Sara Jaramillo Clinker. In Colombia, there are thousands of Sara Jaramillos, but Sara's second last name is German. So. What I did is I called my pedo friends to see if they had any clinker patients to see if, first of all, she was married. And if it, she wasn't married, <laughs> eh, I could get her phone because this was pre-Facebook, pre... So <laughs> this is like stalking. <laughs> I yeah, could this go is to talk about determination. <laughs> So finally, I get her phone and the really funny part is that she had like this uh, working companion who was gay, who calls her into his office and says, look, there's this guy who wants to go out with you. He seems a very nice guy. So now, let, me, you let, me inter let me interject one second. Sara, if, if you're not clear on this, is a television personality. That's is that a fair statement? She's yeah. a television personality. Okay, go ahead. So this guy, this gay guy tells Sarita, okay, so if you don't go out with this guy, let me know because he seems so good. I will go out with him. <laughs> <laughs> so finally I get her phone. She's very nervous because there was actually a stalker waiting oh. for her. Yeah. So she was nervous. She called, she, she was still living with her mom. That's very Latino as well. We live with our parents until a very late age. And she tells her mom, look, there's this dentist who seems to be a very nice guy. Uh, he's asking me to go out with him. So I'm not sure. And Marta said to Sara, what's the worst thing that can happen? You don't like the guy. So you never go out with him. Give him a chance. Mm -hmm. And 
since that first date, we're now 14 years together. Wow. And okay, so to the question about Sarita, Sarita always had this dream of becoming a writer. Mm-hmm. And she got accepted into a program in Spain, Colombia, Spain, Atlantic Ocean. So I said, okay, you got accepted. You have to go. And she said, but you and I, she said, no, this is your dream. My responsibility is to support your dream. So here you go. I'll pay half of your tuition and live your dream. And she lived there for two years because, because it was in literature. We had it clear that she needed all the time to sit down and write. Um, since uh, another interesting thing that happened was uh, you have another business, another uh, interest, which also focused on Sada as well. Tell us a little bit about what that is. One of the trips we made was to India. And Sarita is a fantastic cook. She prepares dishes riquissimos. So when we came back from India, Sarita, who doesn't know how to add one plus one, because it gives her not three or five, it gives her 11. She had this brilliant idea of starting a spy shop and it's called Open Sesame. And this, despite all the advice we got from everyone, the business became not successful, extremely success, successful. And Sarita is the mind behind the, the business. I only get the royalties <laughs> of the business, the dividends. Don't you, I mean, don't you like that? That, you know, when people tell you, ah, you don't do that, it won't work, or isn't it? I mean, for me, myself, a lot of times it's even stimulating. It's just, you know, when I know I have an, an idea or a good idea or something I believe in, just, you know, you're telling me what work, well, I will show you. Was it a bit like this with your spice shop or? Yeah, yeah, we started the, the business in our apartment because, oh. we, because we were afraid to, to rent a space. But then we had to move out the furniture to the garage because we didn't have space to do all, for all the boxes. So in that moment, we decided, okay, we have to rent the space. And the business is now nine years in business, uh, working and every year more and more sales now here, now with the pandemic, with the pandemic uh, business flourish, our two, 2020 was the best year ever. Uh, so do you have, is there a website? One? Yeah. Is there a- yeah, there's a website and an Instagram account where Sarita, we record every every week. We record a, a recipe. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and is it at Open Sesame, OpenSesame.com or? Outetesamo.co. Okay. okay. So as you always say on your on your description below in the description, you'll find yeah. the link. Exactly. Yes, yes, we'll put it there. That, all in the description, the link will be there. So sequentially, what you have happening is Sara is a well-known television personality, but uh, that's not so appealing to her. She doesn't like that so much. No. Um, she's uh, because of the stalker. And because she thinks that the television, the, the, the people in television she doesn't like the fame. She doesn't like, uh, yeah. Yeah, she's not so crazy about the attention, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so now uh, she's always interested. The spice shop happens. She's always interested in writing. And um, it's um, interesting culturally that when the opportunity happened for Spain, as I recall, it was going to be either a one year or a two year commitment. It's very difficult to be accepted to this program, isn't it? Extremely yeah. difficult. So she was accepted, and now you're going to be apart for two years. Yes. Um, and I, I think people listening to this should ask themselves a question. Male or female, or 
in the parlance of our times, undecided. How would you feel about someone who you care deeply about that you're going to be separated from them for two years, that they're gonna be in one part of the world and you're gonna be in another part of the world. How comfortable would you be not only accepting it, but actually as Juan Roberto said, he encouraged mm -hmm. it. He mm -hmm. said, you have to do this. Ask yourself, would you have enough confidence first in yourself to do that Next, would you have enough confidence in the relationship to do that? And I asked Sara before she left, she and I were alone. And I said to her, you understand that you could meet someone else. And Juan Roberto could meet someone else. How do you feel about that? And how do you feel about him supporting you in this? And she said, if he didn't support what I'm doing, then he's not really my man. And if he meets someone else while I'm gone, then I guess I'm really not his woman. Now, can you imagine yourself watching, listening to this podcast? Can you imagine making that decision that you know that there is a seductive risk and you decide to hold your nose and jump in anyway? How many of you would actually do? Stefan, would you do that? You know I would. I know you would. You know I would. I mean, if I want to meet someone, I don't, I don't have to go across the ocean for that. If this is what I want, if this is the way I want to live, if this, if this is exactly, it's exactly what one was, say, was saying, you know, when he got divorced. He was not the type of guy saying, I want to just, you know, meet women and, that's, I mean, if you want to do it, you can do it. You know, you, you can you can meet people, Jerry. It's easy. She could meet people in, in where she is now. You don't have to go for that. It's I think it's a decision you have to you, you have to take. And to be able to do something like that, I think you, it's always and you came. You were the first one who told me that you need these three ingredients in a relationship to make it work. And it's uh, respect, uh, confidence, and admiration. If you yeah. don't have these three things, I don't think you can be comfortable letting someone go or being comfortable with some, somebody going, doing something like that. But if you have these three things, I think it's, it's, it's the only way it can, it can work. So, uh, one. Do you consider yeah. yourself? Do you consider yourself a jealous person? No, no, I, 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 I understand why someone can feel jealous, but I'm not jealous with Sarita. It would be impossible due to now she's not a TV personality, but she has become a literature personality because mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. she returned from Spain, she published her first book and her first book has become a success. So now a different sort of people stop her despite using a face mask. People recognize her in the, when we're walking in the streets and tell her, I read your book. It marked me, it made a huge difference in my life and I really admire you. So, and every, if, for example, I finish here and at two, Sarita has a, a book club from Spain. So she's meeting people every day. She has meetings on, on the web, people who contact her through social media. So it's impossible. It's a trust relationship. How does, how does she deal with that attention? Because she didn't like the attention from, you know, when she was on TV. Now she obviously gets a lot of attention because of her books, and it, does it does she see that differently or? I think now because of all these webinars and the new normality, she can just click off this contact with her fans. Very different yeah. when she's out yeah. in the streets. 
Now yes. she can just turn off her computer or turn off her cell phone and that's, that's it. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, in these things, uh, self-confidence, not arrogance, mm -hmm. self-confidence is essential in any relationship and also, uh, as Stefan mentioned, not only respect, but admiration. And if those things can't continue, and uh, even though they change, the levels of admiration change, uh, the type of admiration changes. Um, if those aren't maintained, I think it's whether, whether it's a, it doesn't matter the relationship, uh, like my relationship with both of you. Yeah. If there's not a mutual admiration yeah. that uh, changes with time uh, and, and age, then okay. there's no, <clears throat> there's no fulfillment to the relationship. Now, tell us a bit about, uh, Sada's book. Okay. Her book is called how I killed my father. What's the title in Spanish? Como mate a mi padre. Yeah. And it's now that oh. that'll get your, that'll get your attention. <laughs> <laughs> That's an attention. Okay, now what's this going to be about? And okay, so here's blow number two. It's autobiographical. Ooh. Why it's this way? Because her it's father. A good thing the title is not how I killed my husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so her father, you have to remember that Medellin, where I live, was the hometown of Pablo Escobar. And this is another thing I, I don't remember. I don't think you remember, Jerry, that Pablo Escobar was my neighbor, not my, no, he lived right beside my house. Whoa. Yeah. When the first car How bomb. We, it, we, we didn't see you in the Netflix <laughs> series, but I don't when, remember your, your character in there. But when you see the scenes from the car bomb they put on his building, you see the debris from my house. Whoa. Because when the car exploded, it blew out all the windows from your house, isn't it? No, it, it destroyed my house. <laughs> Whoa. Because okay. what? So, and in the 90s, Medellin was the most dangerous city in the world, not in Colombia, in the world. Mm -hmm. And Sada's father was a lawyer, a lawyer. And he got threatened, I don't know, we, they never knew what was the cause of, of these threats. But finally he got killed and Sada was so 11. Her father was an attorney, but on the other side of the organized crime people. He was a labor lawyer. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, go on. So her father was murdered by the organized crime people. Five kids, triplets. And Sada's mom was 40. So Sada has four siblings and she's not one of the triplets, right? Yeah. She's and, the only female of the of the bunch. Okay. And is she the oldest or the youngest? No, she's the second one. So can you imagine listening and watching to this that, uh, <laughs> as he said, this is not fiction. No, that's it. This happened. So, yeah, but what, what about the title? So how I killed my father. You you have to read the book. The book yeah, by the course. the book by the way where in Jerry Stefan is going to be luckier than you because the French translation is going to be finished maybe in May or June. That's uh -huh. good. Will it be in French? Comment j'ai tué mon père? Yeah, oui, ma, mon appel, mon chéri. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Getting to another level now. <laughs> Yeah. So the book will be in French, uh, I think, by the end of this year. Okay, good. Yeah, we, uh, we that my wife and I have a 
close friend here in the States, uh, actually right here in Atlanta, who um, reads Spanish very, very well. And she speaks Spanish, but she actually can read better than she can speak by her own description. Mm -hmm. So Sara gave me a copy of the book to give to Sylvia, our friend. Well, Sylvia, of course, couldn't wait to read this thing. What she was shocked by, oh, by the way, Sylvia has a PhD in journalism, just so you understand that. What Sylvia was shocked by was the quality of the writing. Mm. This is a first novel from a young writer, very young, as far as experience. She actually called <clears throat> here while she was reading the book and said, please tell me that this isn't actually all true. Can you imagine? And mm -hmm. Betty, my wife's answer was, oh, it's all true. And Sylvia said, it is so emotionally moving that more than a few times I've had to put it down hmm. and stop for a while. So what was but was she was she most of the time with you when she wrote the book and what kind of mood was she when we she had to I don't know relive or put these things in writing it must have been really hard or this started as part of her assignments in in Madrid when she was there okay yeah but she was writing another book parallel to this so when I was there she sometimes look i've been writing this like small chapters for this class and look take a read them tell me what you think about them and this is part of my macho culture i don't like sara seeing me cry so yeah. i was in, on the second floor reading these chapters and i started to cry because they're very emotional mm -hmm. especially the one where she sees for for the last time her father her, uh -huh. that day when they killed his father she was sick so so she didn't go to school so his her father goes into her room to say goodbye and starts to make faces to her and that's the last time she saw her father and when i read that i was really it was wow and she started to, to, to read this to her classmates and one of the teachers said, look, look at the emotions you are creating with, with your classmates. I think you have something worthy here. And that's the, how the book got started. Now, you just mentioned about this macho part of being Colombian, not wanting to let her see your emotions. Yet, at this point in your relationship, she is the one getting the attention. She has become, since we've been friends for a number of years, I've uh, noticed quite a uh, metamorphosis of her <laughs> personality. And um, how does that affect you as uh, a Colombian male? And be careful, Stefan, because you're next. <laughs> Jerry, I, I, I could have been affected, but I don't want to be disrespectful, but I don't, I don't care. If she wants to become a feminist, I'll support her. But, but not that I don't think that women rights are important, but I'm not going to be part of her agenda or of her, of what she wants to promote as if she wants to go out and march pro feminine rights. Okay. Go ahead. I'll drive you there to the, to the manifestation, but don't maybe if it's for some of the rights i think they for example i'll go in march but it's not i don't want to be part of that game i'll keep my as i don't call her in for my agenda yes we that that's part of what i'm interested in is that you're not calling her into your agenda or uh, but she's also not calling you into hers. Yeah. And that, that doesn't cause any uh, tension in the relationship? No, because we make fun of each other. And because you, Jerry, you have been traveling with us a lot. You see that Sarita 
it's always what Sarita says. Despite she asked me, hey Juan, what do you think? And I asked, answer her, why do you ask me if you already made your decision? No, she's asking you, what do we think? <laughs> no, not we think, what I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I understand you're quite comfortable with this and it's non-threatening. Uh, matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. You consider it exciting. Yeah, yeah. I, I laugh because she thinks she's making me feel important. But I know I'm not important. I'm well, just I'm just one of the pieces in the jigsaw, not yeah. even the one in the corner. But it's interesting that from my understanding, which you can correct me if I'm wrong, but most Colombian men would absolutely not accept this. Absolutely not. Isn't that true? Yeah. 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 Now, Stefan is a French Canadian. How do you feel about this from your cultural standpoint? Because Anybody listening to this should understand that Canadian is one thing, but like Quebecois, the French Canadian, that's another issue, isn't it? It is, but I think in my case, I'm a little, how you say, biased or biased? Which is biased would be biased right. in French, biaisé. Why? Because I have a, an Italian mother, and I mean, it's really an Italian family and with the Italian culture, and I was raised in that type of culture, uh, which a little bit, I mean, seems a little bit like the, the Colombian culture, where you know the, the man or the woman. My mother was exactly like you, Juan. She, was, she never worked. She was taking care of us. She was taking care of the house. My father was the provider. And uh, so I, I grew up like that. But, you know, for me, I, I never understood this, this, this thing for me. I, I mean, I really get pissed when I hear things about, and it's, it's not being about, about feminist or whatever. I, I get pissed when I, when I see that people make a difference. I don't see a difference. You know, you know, Jerry, you know the kind of woman I like. I like independent women. I like brilliant women. I like them even more if they're more brilliant than me. And there are a lot. Most of them are. But that's it. For me, it's attractive. I like that. I never, I never under, understood this thing about, you know, male should be superior or I'm not, and I'm not sure it comes from the culture. I think it's come, it comes from your, your beliefs because, because again, I was raised like, you know, a, a man, I mean, I wasn't doing anything. My mother was doing my lunch when I was at university. I was having fun with that. I was having fun because I was not, you know, some people say, aren't you shy? No, I was proud of it because all my friends were looking at my lunch and all my carrots were cut the same length and all my, I have my little vegetables. <laughs> and I, I mean, I had the perfect lunch all the time. And I even remember telling my mother, makes no sense, you should. And she said, listen, this is what I am. This is what I do. The day you take that away from me, I'm nothing. Yes. Now there is an interesting point that it was your mother's identity. Your mother loved, it was beyond even a love relationship that she wanted to do this. Exactly. Yet, yet we have people saying, well, she's a, she's a product of slave labor. You know, she's, this is completely unfair. This is wrong. I mean, isn't that interesting to hear what you just said is don't take that away from me. Yeah. Now in having been to Columbia, uh, numerous times, I guess I can, I've lost count, um, under various circumstances, um, speaking there at, uh, at meetings is, was, is noticeably different than going to visit Juan at his um, fortress of solitude, which is uh -huh. as remote as uh, you might imagine, although Juan and Sara and I have been to a more remote place, a story for another time. <laughs> Um, actually, maybe not so much a story for another time, because what we found out, uh, what was the name of uh, where La we Guajira. La Guajira. Cabo, La Guajira, Cabo de la Vela. 
and this uh, area is we were almost as far north as you can get on the continent isn't that right yeah not quite but close this was so desolate and remote uh, there was no uh, electricity there's only generators and they have to bring water in there's no water purification isn't it Juan? yeah <clears throat> So these are Colombian Indians, uh, mostly native uh, uh, Colombians, and the name of the tribe Wajou. was the Wayu. What we found out, uh, I think it was, uh, I don't know who made the arrangement, but we had a meeting. It was just Juan Sara and me, and um, there was somebody else there that was at this, when I, when remote uh, is desolate. It's where the ocean and the desert and the mountains meet, except it's mostly desert. It had it wanted it hadn't rained there in what seven years? Yeah. <laughs> no rain. No rain for seven. <laughs> so we have a meeting, and I don't know, maybe Sara maybe arranged this, but we had a meeting with the with the local leaders of the tribe. And they did some traditional dance for us, and then we talked with one of the tribal leaders, or maybe it was a tribal elder, but it was a person of influence. And it was a woman. The mm -hmm. women run the tribe, yeah. not the men. Mm -hmm. Isn't it, Juan? Yeah. yeah <laughs> the, there's only a, a male figure that's called the, the word keeper, which is the person in charge of, like, uh, when there's a conflict, he's like the mediator. Okay. But the rest of business in the tribe is run by the woman. They don't want the men involved. Yeah. So in discussing this with this woman um, of the uh, Wayu, uh, it, it seemed to me that there was some indication that, well, one of the reasons we don't want the men involved now, remember, these are native Colombians. So if you look at Juan, you would say, this guy's Colombian. He looks as Caucasian as Samson does. I mean, uh, well, that's because you're mostly Spanish, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But these are natives and were, uh, I think you mentioned it, that it was a bit um, challenging to understand their language. Yeah, when they spoke in Spanish, their accent is very difficult to understand. But if I recall, I think one of the comments, uh, one of the things about the men not being involved, and this will come as a shock to you, but uh, I was asking through uh, Sara and Juan uh, questions that I found, I, I really wanted the answers to, or at least hear what, she, what the woman, this uh, woman of influence had to say. I think they didn't want the men involved because if the men get involved, not only do things get argumentative, but they can get violent very quickly. So they want the men out of this because a violence can be the result. Don't you recall that? Yeah. Now, my point in bringing this up is, although you're thinking about a society like Colombian society, which is very macho, or Italian society, which is Latino, macho, mm -hmm. Italiano in its own way, mm -hmm. but the women have unbelievable influence. Yeah. And their influence is at a level that is so profound that's it, like it's in, in Japanese society. Well, it's very male dominant, but the women behind the scenes are actually influencing the decisions mm -hmm. to the point where the women actually are making the decisions, but they let the men think they're making the decisions. Now, isn't that true for a lot of you listening to this program? that, um, yeah, your significant other may let you think you're making the final decision if that's important to the individual. Like if it's important to the man or the woman that they make the final decision, like women make the final decision typically still in the USA. Well, by they're making the decision about the children. The yeah, men yeah. just think they're making the decision. Uh, Stefan, that, that, that's a technique. I, mean, I was reading a, a, an article this week on the Harvard a, a business, I, whatever, the journal that I, and they were talking about how they were dealing with Steve Jobs when he was at the head of uh, Apple. And, you know, this, we're always 
ways to deal with them is by making him think he was taking the decisions. Yes. But a lot of time he wasn't, and he was against, like he, he, he never wanted to do a phone. They had to make him come, because there, there was a team, really interesting article, and there was a team working with him, and they were believing that they should do a phone. He didn't want to have anything to do. He thought the, the idea was completely stupid. I did not know that. Yeah, uh, you would like that article. And there's a couple of other things that they had to make him believe that he was the one taking the decisions. When, when you think about that, I mean, a productive relationship um, that's going to be long lasting, long lasting, I think there's an understanding about this. No, no, beyond an understanding, there is a um, expectation that that's how the decisions will be come to, that there's this uh, relationship in the common good. Mm -hmm. So Juan, now that things have changed for you remarkably in a fairly short period of time, right? I mean, you're finishing up the private practice, essentially finished, essentially done. Um, where do you, what's going, what do you see happening next? I mean, if you think 10 years from now, let's say you're about 65, and in 10 years, uh, Stefan will be, what, 65 or 66? 62. <laughs> Same thing. Um, yeah, yeah, I knew that. So um, what do you think, Juan, is the most important thing you will have learned from this pandemic, at least? And I understand that you're looking way into the future. But what do you think the most important thing you will have learned and you have you have two, uh, a niece and a nephew you're, you're very, very close to. Yeah. It, you have a lot of influence over. Yes. So part of that could be, what will you tell them that you learned from this pandemic experience? First of all, that uh, the unknown makes you, well, it's going to scare the shit out of you the unknown, but don't, don't be afraid. Sooner or later, the answer will be there. So remain calm. Don't make stupid decisions. Don't hurry up and, and rush into what you want to make about your life because something different or something strange is happening. I think that when the pandemic started, I, I started to read a lot and see the news and I got to become really, really nervous. And it was affecting my relationship with Sarita because I was COVID monotonous. The only thing I was talking about was COVID. And Sarita said, okay, look Juan, you have to calm down. Mm -hmm. Let's do, let's not try to, to listen to something different from the bad news we are getting 24 seven. So first of all, calm down, try to understand the facts, but don't become obsessed with the facts. And there's smarter people than you. Those are gonna find the answer. It's not up to you to find the answer. I'm not a PhD in microbiology, specialist in virology. No, I have to trust. So that's the second point. You have to trust people because the decision or the answers to these problems are not in your hands. So you have to, despite being an oxymoron, you have to trust your government. Mm. You have to trust science and you have to trust yourself that you're gonna be able to survive these troubled times. And what do you think, Stefan? This is not actually something we've talked about with people in other podcasts. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, I always, before pandemic, pre-pandemic, I always uh, believed and told myself that I could never get bored in life because I was interested in so many things. Uh, music, reading, uh, whatever. I mean, I like to learn all the time. I like to, so I always told myself I could never get bored. 
Never. And uh, this pandemic was a good test to see if that was right. Now, as you know, Jerry, I was really involved in a big project um, during this time, which which did that. I mean, I didn't almost didn't see the pandemic go. I was I was never been that occupied in my life. But at the same time, what it showed me is that I could be, uh, I always thought of myself being really independent. I think I'm independent, but I all, you know, always thought that I don't, I don't really need people or I don't really need, but that showed me that there are some people I really care about and some people that I really miss. And I, I didn't think that could almost be possible. Never missed anyone. I never missed, you know, and it's not being, not being selfish, not being, it's just, I'm not like that. Well, that showed me that I can miss people. I can miss being with people. I can, I, I, I'm really comfortable being alone. I have no problem with that. But like, you know, lecturing lecturing in life to people. I've been doing these online things, but it will never be like having this contact with people. And I think that I will appreciate it a lot more when I'll be able to do it again. Having this contact, this human relation. I mean, this. I think with that, we're that kind of animal. And I th this, I think this is the biggest thing I will get from it. Yeah. Of course, I asked the question, so I had the most time to... Uh, Think about it. Yeah, to ruminate on the answer, mm -hmm. uh, my answer. And I, I mean, I wonder people listening to this, what their answer would be. If, if you were asked that question um, that I just asked, let's say 10 years from now, because for sure, yeah, pandemics even without vaccinations i guess the spanish flu and the black plague they run about three years um even and so we should be doing better than that with the with modern medicine but i wonder what people listening to this what their answer would be um because i, I think it's more interesting to uh, learn something from this about yourself Learning things about other people, of course, is it can be uh, important, mm -hmm. but learning something about yourself. When I was in um, when I was in college, and this was my my first year in college, so this would have been uh, nineteen sixty seven or maybe even nineteen sixty six. You can think about times in the USA at that point, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a uh, psychology lecture given by a fellow who was uh, Indian, that's uh, uh, East Indian. And the, the class was quite rowdy and uh, all of the, uh, you can just imagine the hormone levels of all the students was, we're all about the same age, you know, 18, 19. It's just, it's, it's like fertility rights in there. It's just, yeah, it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, that's right. You'd like an elk. you're sniffing the air. What's up? <laughs> well, the the professor walked in, and um, before people reali realized he was in the room, he obviously had been there for a while, because at a certain point, I remember looking at the clock and thinking, "When's when's the lecture going to start?" Mm -hmm. And as I looked down, it was a kind of an amphitheater. It was a fairly good sized class. Uh, up a few hundred as, as I looked, he was already there sitting there doing nothing. Uh -huh. He was just sitting there looking around with kind of a little smile on his face. Not unlike the Mona Lisa, he was just sitting there smiling. And I looked at this guy and thought, this guy's enjoying this. Well, uh, finally, everything started to sort of calm down. People stopped talking. And he waited some time before he stood up to stand behind the lectern. Mm -hmm. And he stood there and said, you know, 
it's important to enjoy yourself. Now, and that's all he said. And then he started whatever he was going to talk about, which I've forgotten long ago, except for that comment. It's important to enjoy yourself. And it occurs to me, if you don't enjoy yourself, if you're not happy with yourself, nobody is going to be happy with you. Mm-hmm. Nobody is going to be happy with you. So you heard Juan Roberto talk about these dark days where the man's admitting he was not happy and he, what he really wasn't happy with was the relationship, but he wasn't happy with himself. And at a certain point, you decided, I'm done with this. I'm going to get happy with myself. And Stefan, I know that you were not, you were in a circumstance yourself that was not dissimilar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I think as far as the pandemic, uh, people either have either learned they can be happy with themselves, even though we are in fact social animals. Yeah. Because everybody I've talked to in the, as far as the university appointments and the lectures and the stuff that was, everybody can't wait. They're just so ready to come back together, yeah. um, even in small groups, not necessarily big groups, mm-hmm. but it's still, it's a remarkable thing to find out, well, when you're forced into this circumstance, are you happy with yourself? So I think everybody, I think everyone listening is, is aware of the data showing that some relationships between people that have been pushed together for over a year. I mean, my wife and I had never been together this concentrated for this period of time in our relationship and we've been married 40 mm-hmm. years mm-hmm. and we've known each other 43 years but we have never been together for this period of time and what is fairly remarkable to find out my my uh I, i'll just mention again in case you've forgotten betty is my wife's name and she once told one of her friends well my wife is fiercely independent as you two know She is independent to the point where it makes many people uncomfortable. That's how independent, she's like a cat. She doesn't care if you're in the room or not. Well, she used to say, I have two favorite times of the day. When Jerry leaves the house and when he comes back home in that order. (laughs) (laughs) But now it's quite remarkable because her comment is, I don't think I feel that way anymore. <laughs> I, you find out you either really do admire. Now she and, only enjoys when you leave. Yeah. You either, <laughs> well, now she's actually concerned about me leaving. Yeah. That's for it. the first time. Yeah. She's actually thinking, I don't think I'm going to like that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. either you find out you really do like the other person yeah. because you like yourself mm-hmm. or you find out this is a problem. And I'm sure that you've heard about this data that people getting divorced and fighting and needing counseling. And Mm -hmm. and then there are those people that have, that have said, you know, I am grateful to the COVID-19 virus. I've heard people say that. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is I've heard people say it that have said, I have never, nor will I ever again be able to spend this much time with my children. Mm-hmm. Ne- because they've been at home and so have I. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, boys, you I know, well, I say, like you said, it's not about what you do. It's about how much fun you have doing it. Yeah. And if you can't that's entertain yourself, you got a problem. That's yeah. it. I mean, you heard Juan talk about that just before with Sada being in Spain. You heard Stefan talk about that with his the Clear Institute and his not near obsession, complete obsession with the Clear Institute and getting the website going. Uh-huh. And just now you heard a, a bit about what I had to say, and um, I, uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm not. This didn't come as a revelation about uh, how happy I am to be friends with both of you. That. That is actually not a revelation. That's something I've no. been very aware of. It's, a, it's reciprocal. Do you say that? Is that a word? 
Reciprocal. Reciprocal in Spanish. It's reciprocal. C'est réciproque. How, how do you say it? Reciproque, mon cher Jerry. Say it again. How do you say reciprocal in French? Reciproque. It's almost the same. And in Spanish, reciproco. So, c'est réciproque, reciproco, and reciprocal, Reci reciprocal. Reciprocal. In reciprocal. American English, it sounds the least uh, interesting to me. I mean, yeah. when the two of you say it, it sounds very musical. French sounds musical to me. Yeah. Spanish sounds very musical. It does, yes. Uh, yes. It sounds like... It's onomatopoeic, actually. I mean, the whole language sounds like what it really is. <laughs> it's romantic. Well, talking about music, I think it's time to go uh, listen to some Rush. Yeah, well, I Rush Rush initially has little appeal to me because I try to be tranquilo. I don't want to be <laughs> Rush. <laughs> you know, I had a dog once. His name was Rush. Wow. And, I, and because of the group. And I had a dog. And because once, of his character, too. I had a dog once and I named him Prozac. <laughs> <laughs> Our dog is called Curry. Curry. <laughs> Curry because of the spice. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. And, and the cat is called Siracha. <laughs> <laughs> and the other cat. And the, and, the other, and the other cat is called Kafka. Because of Franz oh. Kafka. Our Franz Kafka. Juan Roberto, wonderful. What, I mean, more than wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, we have to do this again. I'm going to say goodbye in Spanish. Remember, Jerry, when I introduced you in in, in, Wash, in San Francisco in Spanish? Yes. In everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, muchas gracias. Fue un honor para mí estar aquí. Y mis dos amigos, y a mi hermano Jerry. Thank you to both of you. Stefan. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup à vous deux. Merci Jerry. Merci Juan. Uh, C'était vraiment, vraiment intéressant. Uh, and, uh, American English is, I'll see you when I see you, unless I don't see you. <laughs> This is everything we had for you today on the Odd Couple Podcast, where the center of resistance is always outside of the box. I'm Stefan Reinhardt, Director of Education for the Clear Institute, inviting you to join us next time as we meet with Rafael Rogowski, another very interesting guest.